welcome to the news updates on Africa Television, reaching you from our studio in Lagos, Nigeria, the nation's commercial capital. I am Deborah Eze. We begin from Nigeria. The Chief Justice of Nigeria yesterday voluntarily resigned from office, citing health grounds. A few hours after resigning from office, senior advocates of Nigeria, lawyers, civil rights groups, and some branches of the Nigerian Bar Association on Monday called for the probe of the S12 Chief Justice of Nigeria, Ibrahim Mohammed. They unanimously said that the allegations against the former CJN should not be swept under the carpet. Buhari warned the Supreme Court's justice against any act that could make Nigerians lose confidence in the judiciary as the country prepared for national election next year. But the Nigerian Bar Association said, despite the cordial working relationship between the bar and the bench under Muhammad, it was impossible to consider his resignation in isolation from the recent developments at the Supreme Court, where 14 justices censored him over his handling of their welfare and related issues. Some of the allegations were said to have involved his children, two of whom emerged candidates of the two leading political parties, the ruling All Progressives Congress and PDP, at their recent primaries. Nonetheless, the presidential candidates of the People's Democratic Party, Alaji Atiku Abubakar, commended the former CJN for seizing the initiative to resign, just as Oyo State Governor Shea Makinde congratulated the new CJN for reaching the peak of his career. And now moving on, ahead of the 2023 elections, the All Progressives Congress has denied budgeting a whooping sum of 6.5 trillion naira to compromise the Independent National Electoral Commission security operatives, judicial officers, and to buy votes. The National Publicity Secretary of the party, Mr. Felix Moka, in a statement yesterday, blamed the PDP for peddling such mischievous information. The party spokesperson clarified that the documents did not emanate from the APC, adding that the party never authored any of such documents. Moka added, indubitably, the document is the handiwork of very sick elements of the opposition People's Democratic Party in a desperate quest for unmerited electoral advantage by attempting to smear our party with wrongs doing. Moka said the ruling party was focused on delivering the dividend of democracy to Nigerians in the hope that they would reciprocate by supporting and voting for the party's candidates come 2023 election. And now still in Nigeria, the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Mr. Godwin Emefiele, yesterday said the objective of the country's exchange rate policy was to preserve the value of the domestic currency and maintain a favorable external reserve position. Emefiele stressed that the Central Bank foreign exchange regime further seeks to ensure external balance without compromising the need for internal balance and the overall goal of macroeconomic stability. The central bank governor also said the overreaching goal of the Apex Bank includes to achieve exchange rate stability and also to ensure a viable external sector, anchor inflationary expectation and improve and support economic growth. The CBN governor who spoke at the opening of the regional course on exchange rates regimes and policies organized by the West African Institute for Financial and Economic Management with participants from Nigeria, the Gambia, Ghana, Liberia, and Sierra Leone in attendance, also said the trust of exchange rate management by the bank was to allow the market system to determine the exchange rate parity in an effective manner, devoid of the activities of speculators and rent seekers. He pointed out that the bank's choice of exchange rate regime had at all times been determined by the prevailing economic fundamentals, adding that it was not uncommon that the dynamics of the external and domestic economic lead to a change in regime. Now away from Nigeria, at least 14 civilians were killed in two attacks attributed to the Allied Democratic Forces in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, where operations by the Congolese and Ugandan armies are struggling to impose peace. The ADF attacked the locality of Mamove and the toll is nine civilians killed, six women and three men. Two older people were wounded and two houses were burned, said Kinos Katuo, president of the local civil society. We have alerted the Hami, but so far, no offensive has been launched, leaving the enemy to roam around freely around looting and killing. 
He added, on Saturday night, we lost five civilians, men killed by the ADF in the attack on the locality of Kisima Center on the Beni Kansidi Road, which leads to the border with Uganda, said Meleki Mulala. Now still on the African scene, Sudan accused the Ethiopian army of executing seven of its soldiers and a civilian taken prisoner, promising to retaliate against this cowardly act. According to a Sudanese military official, the soldiers were captured in a border region near the disputed area of al Haga, a border dispute between Sudan and Ethiopia over fertile land in the vast al Haga region of Jidaref State in eastern Sudan has been a major and long-lasting stumbling block between the two East African countries. The Sudanese army said in a statement, and I quote, in an act that contravenes all convention of war and international law, the Ethiopian army executed seven Sudanese soldiers and a citizen who were their captive. This treacherous act will not pass. It added, promising to respond to their cowardly behavior, end of quote. We now go on a short break, and when we come back, it's updates making the round on the foreign scene. Stay with me. And now welcome back, now on the foreign scene, firefighters and soldiers searched on Tuesday for survivors in the rubble of a shopping mall in the central Ukraine after a Russian missile strike killed at least 18 people in an attack condemned by the United Nations and the West. Family members of the missing lined up at a hotel across the street where rescue workers set up a base after Monday strike on the busy mall in Kremenchuk, in the region of Port Tava southeast of Kyiv. More than 1,000 people were inside when two Russian missiles slammed into the mall, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said. At least 18 people were killed and 25 hospitalized, while about 36 were missing, said Mitro Luni, governor of the Poltava. Leaders of the group of seven G7 major democracies at a summit in Germany said the attack was abominable and Russian President Putin and those responsible will, will be held to account, they said in a joint statement. And meanwhile, the bodies of 46 dead migrants were discovered inside a tractor trailer in San Antonio, Texas, in one of the most deadly recent incidents of human smuggling along the U.S.-Mexico border. A San Antonio Fire Department official said they found stacks of bodies and no signs of water in the truck which was found next to railroad tracks in the remote area on the city's southern outskirts. Sixteen other people found inside the trailer were transported to hospitals for heart stroke and exhaustion, including four minors, but no children were among the dead. The city's police chief, William McManus, said a person who works in the nearby building heard a cry for help and came out to investigate. The worker found the trailer doors partially opened and looked inside and found a number of dead bodies. And now moving on, China will have to seven days its COVID-19 quarantine period for visitors from overseas, with a further three days spent at home, health authorities said on Tuesday. Now the change came in the National Health Commission's latest guideline on measures against the disease. Following seven days spent in centralized facilities, travelers face three days of at-home medical observation, it added, versus seven previously. And still on the foreign scene, North Korean leader Jim Young hoon presided over another meeting of the ruling party to tighten discipline as Yongyang continues to fight the COVID-19 pandemic and gears up for the potential flu damage from heavy rains. The enlarged meeting of the Secretariat of the Central Committee of the Workers' Party of Korea was held on Monday to discuss improving and readjusting the work system of party guiding organs at all levels. State media did not elaborate how the party system was adjusted, but during another secretarial meeting held about two weeks ago, Kim had ordered preserving discipline against abuse of power revealed among some parties official. The North has claimed the COVID wave has shown signs of subsiding, though experts suspect on the reporting the figure of release through government-controlled media. 
North Korea reported 6,710 more people with fever symptoms on Tuesday, with the total number of fever patients recorded since last April, nearly 4.73 million. Yang has been daily announcing the number of fever patients without specifying them as COVID patients, apparently due to lack of testing kits. And now on to the sports scene, a retired Federation of International Football Association barge referee, Prince Donatus Mbaizwe, has asked an Ambra State Governor, Professor Chukuma Suludo, with the need to complete the remaining portion of the Orca Stadium to enable the state to host international football and other sporting tournaments. Mbai Izwe, who is a member of the March Commissioner Appointments Committee of the Nigerian Football Federation, said Orca City Stadium will help in reviving the one-in interest in sports in the state and serve as a place of relaxation and fun. He urged Saludo to seek private partnership in the sports development and completion of the stadium, advising the individuals or corporate bodies that contribute to the construction of any pavilion in the stadium should have it named after them. And finally, Nigeria's women football national team, Super Falcons, arrived in the capital of Morocco, Roberts, yesterday from Casablanca, ahead of the 2022 African Women Cup of Nations, which kicks off on Saturday in four centers across the North African country. Nigeria are the defending champion and the seek to win their 10th crown in the 12th edition of the championship, which pits the best African countries in the battle to decide the best football playing nation among the lot. Nigeria will also play against Botswana only or on July 7th and Buridi on July 10th in the group phase of the competition. All four semi-finalists in Morocco will qualify to represent Africa at the FIFA's Women World Cup in Australia and New Zealand next year. With the fifth place team handed an opportunity to also gain a place through a playoff tournament holding early next year. And that concludes the news update on African Air Television. Remember, follow all our social media platforms on Jointum, Pangram, Instagram, Facebook, and on Twitter in their respective order. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, like, and leave a comment for me on the comment section. And you can also link us up on www.africunia.tv. Once again, I am Deborah Eze. Bye for now.